I'll just talk like this. Can you hear me? Okay. Oops, this is a little awkward. Ah, there we go. I just took it off by accident. <laughs> okay, guys. First of all, when I was at Brighton last week, they tell you don't use bullet points because it's the death of a slide. These are highly technical talks, so there's extra stuff on here so you know what I was talking about. There's extra reference material, so if you need to go look at it, you can. If you see a slide with a bunch of text, I'm not reading that. I'm just giving you as a reference for later, so you can read it or you can do the link. Also, on all my slides that have something that was taken from somewhere else, I do have the citation, so you can go actually look up the full documentation. Okay, just a quick explanation. So we're going to talk about Google machine learning and SEO. Can you guys hear me? I can't tell how loud this is. OK. And it's not working. <laughs> Why is it not working? There we go. I'm going to have to do it from the mouse thing. These are just some of my bona fides. It's not a big deal. So um, I had a degree in art and sociology when I got out of college. You know what my first job was? A barista. <laughs> you too? Because that's all you can do when you have a job and a degree in art and sociology when you first get out of college, at least when I got out of college. Um, but then I got lucky with a local firm. I was a front end dev, uh, HTML, CSS, all that for many years. That was my primary job. Um, and then designer, my big claim to fame back then is I designed Reba McIntyre site, coded it. It's awesome. Um, I've been a consultant since 2009. Some of the sites I've worked for that aren't under NDA, as all consultants know, most everything you do is under NDA. <laughs> Um, I'm a judge on all the search awards. If you ever want tips on how to do better on that, just reach out to me. I can't give you like any super secrets, but I can tell you how, what we read, how you get judged. Um, and during the pandemic, I did all of them because I had nothing else to do. Um, I specialize in site auditing, site recovery, technical SEO, but I do all SEO. It's just I specialize in those. I start every client with an audit so I know where they are before we get going. Uh, articles in all the major journals, and then a speaker at those conferences and some others. So like most people here are speaking. So I'm going to take you all the way back to the beginning only for a second, because this kind of sets up where we're going. So this is actually the first what Google was called in the, uh, sorry, I have to click on screen. This is the paper that started Google. Have any of you ever read it? Right? So it's really interesting. They developed the idea of backlinks through academic papers and using citations and academic papers as a way to know that that paper was cited often and therefore a valid possible research document. And so, and the first name for Google was Backrub. Does everyone know that? All right, it's such a weird, such a weird name, right? So that's how Google started. And when Google started, this is how big they were, 147 gigabytes, which I think we could fit on most of our phones, right? The entire initial Google was what you could fit right out on, on your phone and probably have space to spare. Today, that was 2022. I couldn't find one for this year. But roughly over half the world, 5 billion people use the internet every day. Google has something like anywhere from 94 to 98% of the search in every country in the world. And it processes trillions of queries and has billions of websites. By the way, whenever you hear an SEO theory, before you think that it's real or you apply it, can it, can it be scaled to this easily? And if it can't, ignore it because Google can't do it, right? It has to be able to apply it to the trillions of pages. So in one day last month, there were over three, that's a billion, right? Billion, <laughs> 3.5. Sorry, I've done two talks in four days and two conferences in two cities. So if I stumble a little, please excuse me. So 3.5 billion Google searches in one day. And in one second, 78,000. Google searches. Think of the mass scale of that, right? How, how much they have to process to re you type it in, return a result that's relevant to you. Although right now, uh, today, they're not relevant and I'm not going to go over that today, but it's really, really bad. So there's something going weird in Google, but normally it's uh, pretty relevant. So this is really big data. So we started at 147 gigabytes and now we're at 70,000 searches a second, 3.5 billion searches in a day, right? So Google had to make a sense of it all. This, we do not understand documents. Has anyone read the DOJ report, Google versus the DOJ? Look it up. Uh, Search Engine Land has a great break, breakdown of it. So does Search Engine Roundtable. These slides, uh, I'm going to show you a couple slides from that, are Google saying in the DOJ documents, prior to what we're going to talk about today, 
they don't under, actually, understand actually the document. So this is the slide. By the way, did anyone else look at these? Just me? Do you think it's weird that they look like Microsoft Paint? Like all the, all the images in this document look like Microsoft Paint. But someone explained to me that's because of legal and that's a whole other thing. So this is an actual Google slide. And this came from around, two, around 2017, 2016. Remember when titles were so ultra important? Like the title tag was everything, right? The H1 the URL, exact match domains, all that. That was Google understanding the document because Google couldn't understand what the text actually said. They used all the links coming in and the anchor text to tell it this is pages about a dog or this page is about chocolate. So before we get into all the machine learning, they didn't really have a good way to do it. That's why it was so easy to manipulate with things like exact match domains, titles, H1s, things like that. So in our machine learning, so we're going to do a brief, what is machine learning AI? Everyone kind of uses AI to cover it all right now. It's kind of the common term, but they actually are different. So most of the progress we've seen is based on machine learning, a subfield of AI where they recognize patterns. ChatGPT is not AI. It doesn't think, it doesn't analyze, it doesn't do anything but do the next most likely word in a sentence. And that's because it's recognizing a pattern of everything it was trained on, and then it produces it. Okay, so we're looking at machine learning and Google. We're not looking at AI, but everyone's just going to call it AI anyway. So use it how you want to, but just to make the distinction. Uh, myth, AI is approaching human intelligence. AGI is the next step in AI. That will be human intelligence, like starting level. This is not. This is just basically taking complex things and simplifying because it can recognize patterns from what it's trained on and it knows how to do things. I mentioned ChatGPT and the others because these are also similar to some of the things that Google are doing. And everyone I noticed in, a, in an earlier session was using ChatGPT, right? Is everyone using? How many? All right, okay. So uh, just basically, also when it like when a ChatGPT like answers all the questions and like the bar or something, it's easy for it because it trained on that material and then it just knows what the most likely answer is. So Google is using machine learning and organic search engine in three places. Now, Matt Cutts used to say, does everyone know Matt Cutts, right? I'm not that old, right? OK. Matt Cutts used to say he would never use machine learning in a ranking signal, because if it broke, they could not fix it. Um, I'm kind of, I think they're at that point right now, but that's for another talk. <laughs> so there's a pre-scoring model. Does everyone know what the pre-scoring language models are? No good, because we're going to get into that. Uh, ad hoc post-scoring. Have you heard of neural matching? Most people have not heard of neural matching. It greatly affects the sort order at the end, but you cannot affect it very well. And then, of course, the helpful content update. And then SGE and MOM are in a class by themselves. We're not going to do much on SGE today because there's not really a lot that you can do with SGE right now because SGE is just a large language model that's reproducing results. My theory is they're not doing a true large language model like ChatGPT where it just writes things. It's too expensive for Google. Someone estimated in the research documents I read it would cost a thousand dollars, I mean, a thousand times more per query, billions of queries a day. Even if that was one cent, that would be a massive expense for Google. So we see how many people have seen copyrighted materials in the SGs, right? Raise your hand. Yeah, that, LLMs don't do copyrighted materials. They train on them, but they don't reproduce them word for word. And Google is. So my theory is also because you can remove it with a no snippet. Um, that they're using featured snippets and other data that they already have in their in their corpus, their databases, and they're rewriting it with an LLM, but they're not actually doing true LLM. It just would be too cost prohibitive. So pre-scoring machine learning AI. We're going to talk a little bit about how Google handles, handles language. So when we talked about before, they don't understand the documents, right? It's like the title has these words in it, and this word's the first one, so we can say this word's most important. That's how, how many people have been in SEO that long? Right, where the title tag, right? And then you had to make sure you covered the S and the ED and the ING in your content because otherwise it didn't know. Like I had a, doc, a chiropractor in Atlanta and we had to make titles that said chiropractor in Atlanta, Atlanta chiropractor, chiropractic, Atlanta, Atlanta chiropractic, just so Google would know that this whole page was about these different things because it saw them all as different. The This was the strings to things move hummingbird where it went from bag of words approach, which is doing that. Although it started that earlier, it didn't really start implementing the, the machine learning until later. So the word to vec embedded model, how many people have heard of this? Yay, at least some. So Google represents words in a continuous vector space. 
and similar words are mapped together. So when somebody says like, you need experts to write your content, Google's not saying you need experts to write your content. They're saying you need to write with expertise because in our vector space, in a topical model, because that's this layer we'll talk about later, neural matching, we know that these words appear in all the documents with co-concurrence, mean close together, and similarity. So we as SEOs could discuss something that's very new, but we're going to use the same words, right? Can't you instantly tell when someone's not an SEO? By the way, they talk, right? Or write. True, right? So that's what they're looking at when they're looking at expertise. They're seeing if you write with expertise using these vector models, not did an expert I track around the world with trillions of documents and hundreds of billions of people, hundreds of millions, like know all these people. They don't. They're looking in these embeds. So it's, what's that? No, there's no authoring. That did come from Google Plus, and if you ever want to hear about how Google was almost an identity project, then look me up. Um, but it's not that. This is what the vector space basically looks like. So you can see like male and female, they're very close. It's a mathematical relationship. They take the word, they turn it into a mathematical um, number, they put it into the vector space. I'm being very layman here, of course. It's more complicated than this, but... And then the ones that are close together are close together. So Google knows like ice, T is something closely related. So if you put it in a document, it kind of has an idea of what it is. It doesn't actually know, but I'm gonna say no. So, but if I said iced dog poo, you'd be like, what? Because <laughs> in the vector space, there'd be no relationship between the two. People aren't looking for iced dog poo, unless maybe someone came up with a chocolate drink and called it that. <laughs> no, it's awful, right? So this is a knowledge graph. Knowledge graphs are not new. Google did not invent them. They're around since the 70s. So the original databases are like your spreadsheet. You put all of that in a column, there's fields or unique identifiers. But with the knowledge graph, it gave them the ability to reduce the resources and processes needed. And then you could actually put things in this vector space relationship. So you have like a, almost up, down, right? Like this X, Y, Z relationship between words and phrases. So words go in, get assigned a mathematical address, similar and related words sit close together. like. I know Steve really well, so we do close together. I don't do that well. Right? Because we don't have a relationship, but we do. And that's what it's looking at for words. Then these interpretations of these words, when you ah, I keep hitting, I talk with my hands. Uh, when you turn when you put in your query, you it comes back with whatever it believes would match that the best. That's why it's so important to do your keyword query research, to write with um, clarity and topical focused. So it was very slow, though. That's the problem. So did Bert. How many people know about Bert? Yay! So Bert is natural language processing pre-training called bidirectional encoder representations from transformers, or Bert. So Google was doing something called natural language understanding before that, which is the word rec, simplified version. They moved to NLP, natural language processing. They're trying to understand your documents like I'm speaking. So are you translating, unless you're not a English for a speaker, are you translating my words in your head right now? You're not, right? You just you know what I'm saying, right? That's what Google's trying to get to. They're not there yet, they're in the infancy, but that's what they're trying to do. Understand what you're saying in the document so they know exactly what it means semantically. So this is when BERT launched, 2019. It is not used for ranking. Lots, there are a lot of documents like BERT, 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 you gotta do BERT. BERT's a language model they use before they do everything else in search. Um, so basically the idea is if you were doing SEO before they started doing this, do you remember like you didn't need to worry about ats and fours and sentence structure, right? I remember that? School, there's all sorts of stop words that Google didn't look for, right? Didn't use, didn't, didn't use in a sentence. Uh, Bert changed all that. Now it knows. I uh, can I get medicine for someone at my pharmacy? It knows you're looking for medicine for at my. Those words used to be ignored before Bert. One of the words, slides with tons of text that I'm not going to talk about. This is just if you want the full definition of what Bert is and you're a geek like me and you want to go down the rabbit hole of fully understanding it, this is your starting point. That link will take you there. If anyone wants to take a picture, otherwise I'll move on. Okay, so this Bert is an LLM, large language model, similar to ChatGP. Um, not similar, like just in concept. I don't mean exactly in use. So it can go forward or backwards. So the old way of interpreting language was it had to have a sentence, had to disambiguate the sentence. Did anyone do grammar like things on sentences when they were a kid and hated it so much? That's what they had to do to understand anything. Bert changed all that. 
So it allowed him to derive context from what was written forward backwards, but also guess the masked word, which is also what ChatGPT does. By the way, ChatGPT built all their tech based on Google and BERT. So they didn't take BERT and use it, but all the concepts. There's a thing called making dilettantes out of debutantes or something like that. I can't remember exactly the phrase. I love it. That's where the hallucinations word came from. Google's not behind in the tech. Google invented the tech, right? ChatGPT just made it explode. So this is what that looks like. So which Sesame Street blank is your favorite? To see the mass word, it can go forward or backward. It can figure it out either way. Okay? And that makes it super efficient. So the cost of processing trillions of queries a year suddenly went way down. Suddenly Google didn't have to just do title tags, H1s, your URL. Now they could actually start looking at document text because they can now afford the processing behind it. It can understand the difference between the fish ate the cat and the cat ate the fish, right? That there's, now granted, it doesn't read it like we do as a human, but it has a good idea what, if you have a bunch of sentences together, what it's actually talking about. The big, big change here was the transformer and self-attention. So it allows the program to look at the words in the sentence just once and understand how they relate to each other. And again, we have those vector relationships and those known uh, entities. That's why entities are so big in SEO. Because those the entities in a sentence, and then they have context and they have semantic relationships, so they can understand better what your document's about. If you, I haven't run this test, but if anybody has, please let me know. I would love to test entities versus non-entities in a document, meaning the same thing, and see which one does better. Because my prediction is the one that has the entities, Google already can understand within the context of this, um, they'll do better, just because it's easier to process. Confused yet if you are, it's okay, because this is totally heady stuff. I will bring it down to a simple slide with things that you can do, I promise. So basically, this is all BERT is, predicting words in a blank. That's also all ChatGPT does, predict words in a blank in a sentence structure. If you're using it for analyzing it and stuff, it's not doing that, unless it has a special plugin with it. So does this matter to SEO? It's not really that much. You can't affect it. It's not working off of anything you're doing. You can't optimize for it. You just need to know it's there because that is how Google's looking at your page. That's how Google's interpreting your content. And that's, uh, I, I told you I'd stumble my words. Prevent, uh, present, <laughs> provides better <laughs> understanding. <laughs> All right, two conferences. No sleep in hotels for like a week now. Now we're gonna look at post scoring ad hoc algorithms. By the way, I'm using the big words because that's what Google calls them, not because I'm trying to be academic here, okay? Ad hoc scoring is actually what they call it. This is from the DOJ documents. This is not exactly what they're doing, but it does give a good flow about what we're about to talk about. So you have the search query, the query rewriter, because it does rewrite the query as you put it in. And then over here we have the calling index Muppet, which is retrieve and score your documents. So everyone knows your documents get a score, right? That's how they decide which one goes one and which one goes, not the only reason, but a big part of it goes to 100 based on your scoring, right? And that's made up of all different things. Super root here previously is what we're gonna talk about when we talk about rank brain and neural matching. So that is post scoring. So your links have been counted, your document has been counted, your relevancy has been counted, your site health, your technical, all that's all been counted. You've been scored, you're here, here's a result. And then they go, oops, we wanna be better on intent matching, do, 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 reshuffle, and you might go from the one to the 10 because your document doesn't match the intent well or well enough. That's what the just ranking is. Nothing affects that except your ability to write content towards what your users are looking for and to match that intent. So rank brain and neural matching are based on the documency relevancy model. And that means it's uh, just using the text of each document. And again, we're in that vector space, right? Where other documents are like you, right? So but that's how they're judging re relevance. So that is post scoring. So you could go one to 10 just because the way you say it isn't the way most people say it. Now you don't have to regurgitate, that's a bad thing. But if you're like writing medical stuff, don't have the guy who's the plumber write it because chances are he's not using the same language. It will not be as relevant to the user searching for it. So both are reordered. That is called ad hoc retrieval, that's what they call it. And it's ranking only the document with text. And I put a slide in there, so I think it's going to appear somewhere else. I must have accidentally dropped it somewhere else, but uh, we'll see. 
Uh, one of these algorithms that uses AI and live results is RankBrain. I found RankBrain before it was announced. Yeah, I had an article at Search Engine Land. And they go, you're gonna have to hold off your article. Google has a big announcement. And they announced RankBrain. So I actually followed it for like six to eight months before it went up. RankBrain, have you ever seen the kitchen sink queries? That's always RankBrain. RankBrain's on all queries now, but sometimes it's ramped up and sometimes it's much smaller. So if you surf, search for something, you're like, why does it have these five other things that have nothing to do with what I'm searching for? It's because Google doesn't understand the intent of the query. So it's used for unknown queries where entity meaning relationships are unclear. So if suddenly I was writing it, it was like, We're a common query. We know each other. We have relationships. Also, not these. <laughs> um, so what that means is it doesn't know the relationship. We have two entities, and it's going, I don't know why someone's searching for these entities. I don't know why they're searching for this query. So I'm going to pull back a kitchen sink result. Presence of rank brain means it's confused. This is actually important, though, to you as an SEO, because if you find that you're not getting good click through, Go check your result. Do you have a rank brain result? That means you could probably be writing better to that query, or you need to tell, let Google know you're the one who is about that query. And that can involve writing more content or other things, but it is confused. It doesn't know what it's looking at. And the way I found this, by the way, is I was look, looking for water rights in Mesquite, Nevada, which in Nevada, anyone from Nevada? Mad at me because I just said it wrong. No, I did say it right. I usually say Nevada. People get very mad. Um, really, they do. But I was looking for water rights, and I saw mesquite barbecue, mesquite trees, mesquite uh, flavory, mesquite. I'm like, I'm looking for water rights. Why am I getting mesquite everything else but water rights? I did get where to pay your water bill. But it's a very small town with very few queries for water rights in mesquite. And then I did it all the small towns in Nevada, and all of them came up the same way. But when I did Vegas and Reno or Washoe County and Clark County, the two major population centers in like contain 90% of our population, they were normal. So that's when I started following it. And what I realized was that it didn't know what I was talking about. So here's one. Uh, sweets. If you're in the UK, sweets automatically mean what? Anyone? Candy. Right. It's candy. This is the US and Vegas. And at the time, this is what you got for sweets. This is the result. This is like a rank brain result because it doesn't really know what I'm looking for. It's got Dr. Sweet Sweat, which I still haven't looked up to find out what it is because it just sounds gross. <laughs> got some sweets, grocery and gourmet food. I got one candy. Then I got Starting Sweets, Business Sweets, Pea Candy, Thomas Sweet. So it doesn't know what I'm looking for. This is a rank brain result. It's confused. So rank brain uses your easy queries and clicks to understand query intent. By the way, there was no big revelation. Rand wasn't right. There was the clicks are not used to rank your specific document. You cannot affect it, but temporarily in a search result maybe for a day that way. What it's doing is it's taking the information, like those mesquite queries, and it puts it back into the machine. And over time, it says, oh, this is the right result for that intent. Right? And we're going to see this in these screenshots. So this is from the DOJ docs. This is, I think, from 2017. So every search you do benefits the person forward from you. So if we have an unknown result, unknown search, but a million people start searching for it, say it's a new product or something, Google will refine that and stop doing the rank brain result and give you a full result because it understands what the query is. This is also from the DOJ doc. It, right, paint, right? Am I wrong? It looks like paint. This is Google, right? It's like paint. You think they'd have an art department. Anyway, results, the SERP interaction comes back to learning models and it comes back into the search results, that's where machine learning really kicks in because the machine learning is telling, your queries are telling it with the machine learning what the patterns are that people are searching for. And so when you do a query in the future, then you can find it, you'll get a better result or you get a full result because now it knows what that match is. Remember, it's used mostly on unknown queries or queries with weak relationships. So sweets. A year later, now there's still poor intent matching, but notice a difference. I live in a very international city. I can't tell you why suddenly people would be searching more for sweets as candy, but it occurred, as we can see, it's getting better. Rank Brain also uses geolocation. 
So there are common terms for suites like in the UK where it knows what that is. The entity is known, right? So entities aren't singular definitions. They're also based on where you live, like the geolocation, even trends, things like that. So a year later in London, I pull it up. Well, it definitely knows what sweets is, right? I mean, I even have a knowledge graph, sweets and chocolate, right? This was this is like, oh, sweets, UK. Sweets, they're looking for candy, chocolate, something related to that. You saw my first result, Dr. Sweet said, whatever that is. This is in Texas this year. So you saw the result from earlier, right? From like four years ago. Now look at this. I just did this this week. Well, now it kind of pretty much knows what sweets are. That's because over time, Americans either adopted sweets, because I don't know what happened here or there's something viral, but over time, people have told it, when I'm looking for sweets, I don't want Dr. Sweet Sweat, whatever that is on your body. I want candy. I want chocolate. And so that query, that click has of millions of people or tens of thousands of people or a billion people have informed Google that this is the better intent match. So when you see a rank brain result and you're not getting click through, you're not meeting an intent match. So you want to go back through and see, can I claim the intent match by writing more content because maybe it's branded? Or should I move the document to a better term? Is the term not really that relevant for most people? Because if it's getting a big rank brain result, it's not a highly searched term, no matter what the tools tell you. So semantic relevant suites didn't have, at the time, a definitive entity result in the knowledge graph. It didn't really know what it was. Could be a bunch of things. So rank brain relationships between entities and search intent are weak or unknown. Behind the scenes data is continually fed into the machine. Over time, it learns. And uh, you just want to make sure that Google is not confused about what your intent of your document is when you see a rank brain result that's heavy. And when I say heavy, I mean like one result is you and everything else is like a mess, right? Because the rank brain's in everything. And right now, it's really bad. <laughs> I searched for like my podcast today and somebody that was on the podcast. I got like untitled, 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 weird results from around the world and like nothing related to my podcast. So don't take this for fact today, but normally that's how it works. Okay, so now we're going to add neural matching. Remember, these are added post scoring ad hoc. Again, this is machine learning. It's launched in 2018. This is the one most people don't know about, right? So it's a uh, Use for ranking, post scoring, looks at querying content. Uh, can you optimize for it? Yes and no. Uh, this is what it does. Insights how to manage a green. Does anyone know what that means off the cuff, by the way? I was at one conference where everyone knew and I was like, really? Because I had never heard of it before. It's a management style. It's a person is in your team is called a green, right? So, but it can, neural matching can decipher that's what you're looking for because it's a topical layer. So we have topical vectors. There's actually patents on this too. There's topical vectors and Google knows the documents in this vector are related to each other. And then if it sees green as something new, it goes, oh, well, that's related to all the other things by the entities we see in the documents. So maybe this green thing is related and they'll see how it goes. So uh, neural matching is like, if I put all the Marvel comic characters on a page and there's no Marvel's never mentioned, they know what it is, okay? So have you ever seen a page where you're like, why is the keyword not on my competitor's page in the ranking? That's neural matching. This is an older slide because it was only 30% back then, but it just shows you, if you want to geek out on it later, exactly how it works in the layers. So this is an older slide when it came out, but this is the best example of what the two are, so or neural matching is. So you can see over here that it goes, change brightness on a laptop, adjust, change, convert, change, exchange, change, install. So it knows what it means by the context of the semantic relationships and also the entity definitions. So, by the way, that was for both of these. Links cannot affect either of these. You're gonna have a billion links and it's not gonna matter. You're gonna get posts scored based on the relevancy of your documents to what people are searching for. They're trying to get a better intent match on the final SERP. So they do the scoring, they do the final SERP, and then they resort again to get the actual final SERP. So you can only do so much to affect this. So you want to be as good as you can and adhere to the best practices as you can. But if you notice you're not doing well, check your document relevancy to what people are actually searching for. That means not SEMrush or Ahrefs, but going to your GSC um, using the API and finding what people are really looking for to get into your results. Also, Sightbulb and Screaming Frog will pull this information for you if you put keywords on. It'll pull all this for up to a year. 
So you can get what people actually look for when they were coming to your site. And then you can see, was I way off? Like people were looking for this and that's not what we meant. Or you can see, oh, we, we did get what we meant, but Google's not understanding it. So you wanna make sure that you understand that that's why when Danny says uh, content so much, means so much, they're talking about this. Now, content is not everything. If they can't crawl and index your site, I'm a technical SEO. It doesn't matter what you do with your content, but if you got everything else right, this is the really important part. Okay, so rank brain versus neural matching, just real quick so you understand the difference. Rank brain relates pages to concepts and neural matching relates words to searches, meaning it can take those Marvel comic characters and go, oh, this is about Marvel because rank brain told me it's about this concept and neural matching told me these words are attached to Marvel comics because they're real close in the vector space, topic space. So now we have the two that work together to bring back your content. Oh, by the way, all images are either DALI or uh, Midjourney. Just to make sure people know, except one image of the older woman. So helpful content update. How many got hit by this? Yay, nobody's lives were destroyed. <laughs> so, I mean, I really think it's time Google stopped doing like 90% deprecations because these people aren't trying to scam anything. They're just like, we thought we did it right. And Google says no. So do you all know how it works? So it's a constantly running machine learning algorithm that does have updates. So the updates are like big changes that can drop you dramatically. Otherwise it's running all the time and it's looking for Helpful content, right? I wish I would define that better. Um, it's a tirely machine learned model, exactly what Matt Cutts said he would never ever do because if it broke, they couldn't fix it. So I don't know that's why we're having so many updates, but it could be why we're having so many updates. So basically it's an extension of Panda, Penguin, Hummer, all these about content and user experience. Because Penguin people think was just links, it wasn't. It was also about site quality and content quality, about violating the webmaster guidelines at the time. So, um, so basically helpful content is the first of that. That's an angry SEO from Dali. It's, okay, it's kind of weird. <laughs> Do you look like this when you're angry? <laughs> so it's a ranking signal, not an update. They use updates to make major changes to the ranking signal, like content, the, uh, yeah, the other update, what, what am I blanking? Content, right? Whatever, core update, core update is all the major ranking signals being updated. This is the same kind of thing. Um, it's always rolling. By the way, if you get hit by one, you cannot get out of it for two to three months, they sandbox you. So you will be down, but that's also because it's always running. So most updates require that the update runs again to get full recovery on your site. But because this one's always running, you don't have that. So they wanna make sure that you got a sufficient you know, smack down so you won't do it again if you figure out what they're doing because helpful content is kind of amorphous. Um, other pages can lessen the devaluation. So it's like if you had 10% pages that didn't like, you might get a 10% down. And I'm not saying this is exactly equated, but this is what they're saying. If you didn't like 90% of your pages, you might like lose 90% of your traffic. It's weighted, it's given to all pages on the site. It's a site wide penalty. Well, devaluation, not penalty. But uh, it also is based on how much of your site it didn't like. So the role is also to add page experience because they want you to know content quality is, is also with page experience. By the way, something interesting I learned from Philly's talk yesterday on 404s, if you have a lot of soft 404s, Google actually is going to devalue your content, assuming it's not of good quality or top quality because you have the 404 issue. So you wanna make sure you check that out. So it's about page experience. This is new, they added it a, about a month ago, I think, something like that. Um, if you don't know about these things, Google has this all written down. By the way, Google has a whole section now on ranking systems. Do you guys know that? Read it. Don't read the QRG, which is not associated with ranking signals. You may accidentally hit them. I mean, it's good for getting a good idea of what a quality site is. Read the ranking systems because they actually tell you what they're looking for. They give you guidelines, right? Google has never given us the ranking systems before. I mean, it started years ago when the only people we could ask is each other. Like, what do we think Google did? I don't know, what do you think they did? I'll run a test, I'm a black hat, I broke it, here's how it works, right? <laughs> right, he knows. That's what black hats are great for, right? They tell us how things work. So the, the, what you wanna do is make sure you read these ranking systems and follow all the blue links because they start very general and then they get very detailed. AI content, helpful content update. Um, this is a theory, but it's also based on things John has been saying. So um, on Twitter, 
First of all, there's a myth that they can't detect AI systems. I go to DEF CON, I went to the AI Village, we had several of those people on our webcology show. They talk about LLMs, of course they can, because there's ways that humans write and there's ways that AI write. There's words that AI would put in a sentence that humans wouldn't put in the sentence. They can detect it, detectors suck. It doesn't mean that someone with like a thousand MIT grads can't figure out how to detect AI content, right? But there's not the good detectors. The det detectors are awful. I added 160% and the score kept going up. I was like, what? It's like at 98% by the time I edit it, like 70%. It's crazy, right? But they can recognize the patterns. There's things called burstiness, um, things like that you can look up or um, I'm going to explain to you how they can. We're not going to get into that today. They do already have an algorithm that detects respawn content. This is in 2022 before ChatGPT was announced. So it detects repurposed scraped content through AI because the way AI, AI writes is very predictable. Human's burstiness is like, I use short sentences, long sentences, commas, not commas, different words. I mix my metaphors. I do all that. We are imperfect humans, and the imperfectness of that makes it easier to detect when it writes it perfectly. Right? So they can detect it. Now, they're not doing AI detection to bring down your site. But, by the way, they changed what spammy means. Automatically generated content that's being produced programmatically without producing anything original, adding sufficient value. This is the helpful content update. We're a big part of it. Are you adding value? Are you adding information? John has been on Twitter saying, AI content is a anchor on your neck because it's just regurgitated. For those who don't know, the AI cannot go outside what it was trained on. It cannot add anything new. It cannot be original. It cannot add insight. It also can't do depth. It does breadth because of what it was trained on, how it was trained to produce. It may seem like it's an original to you, but you haven't read a trillion documents. Right? Google has a trillion documents in its corpus, or billions, in its corpus. So in its topical relevancy, it can kind of see, are you writing basically the exact same thing everyone else is writing? Well, OK, why do we need to surface you? I'm now, Google's now going to have a big resource problem. Right? Instead of billions of pages, they could go to a trillion in six months. So they have to do something to bring this down. So the issue is not only directed at this, but, and it doesn't mean that Regular content get hit, can't get hit too. Of course, it's not detecting AI. It's making guidelines that AI can't meet. This is their spammy. Sorry, I forgot to put the link on there. These are some things in yellow that is in the HCU guidelines that AI can't meet. Okay, so um, it says, are you summarizing without adding much value? Yes, because that's all it does. It summarizes what's on the web already, writes the most next likely word in a sentence and puts it out there. And it was trained to sound really good and it was trained to sound confident, it was trained to sound human. Doesn't mean that Google doesn't know it's the same as a thousand other documents or a million other documents. Um, extensive automation to produce the content. Oh, we're fine with AI content, everyone says Google said. That was their first statement with some qualifiers. And now their statement is, no, you can't just put AI content out there, it is an anchor on your neck. Now, can you use it for ideation? Yes. Can you edit it heavily? And I mean, basically rewrite it, not like you change some text. Can you use it to fill in some gaps? I know a tool out there that's new where they fill in some gaps in your content. That's fine too. But do not take AI generated content, throw it up on the web and go, well, they didn't get hit, so it's fine. It takes a long time to get around the web. It takes a long time to apply the scoring. Uh, if anyone's been through Penguin, you know every site didn't get hit in the first, second, or third update, right? But a lot of sites did. If you see affiliate marketers right now online, they're mostly the ones who are like, oh my God, I lost my entire site. I don't know what I did wrong. Now, it hits good sites too. So I haven't figured out that part, unfortunately, yet. I know sites that are original content. They did a good job. Everything should be okay, and they got hit. But these algorithms also, because the machine learning can hit things accidentally. So it's, it's going to be a process, a learning process, because we've only had a couple updates as it goes through. But basically, don't take straight AI content, because Google's already said it's an anchor on your neck. Google's already said we don't reg want regurg regurgitated content. And if you go through the helpful content guidelines, you'll find at least eight to 10 statements that AI cannot meet. So no, it's not detecting it, unless it's like reruns, rewritten spun content. But it can't meet it. And if you can't meet the quality signal that they're telling you exists, and Google doesn't want to index that content. Remember, a lot of people are like, my content's not indexed, right? Are you seeing that? That's not just AI, but a lot of those people wrote AI content. I know, because they were asking John, I wrote AI content, and now it's not being indexed. And John's like, oh, well, John's a little saucy lately. Mom, we're going to go over briefly. Mom, 
is a, a taking BERT and putting it on steroids. It can take images and video and everything, put it together and write, it can even write a whole document, produce a whole search result. MOM's a thousand times more powerful than BERT, which also means resource cost goes way down, which means we can do more application. Um, this is one of the slides with tons of extra words you can read later. Um, they also use anything they do, they use the quality raters to assess using the quality raters guide, which is a document for quality assessors, not SEOs. Right? So if you write to everything in there, you're going to hit some ranking signals. You'll have a good basic website, but you're not definitely hitting ranking signals. That's why I said the ranking system. But to test their stuff, Mama goes through quality raters. They do thousands of tests. Google decides that they worked or not. They summarize it all. They take it to the engineers. They take it to legal. They take it to every department. It gets signed off, and eventually it makes it back into the ranking signals. If anyone tells you stuff from the QRG group, the QR quality raters go straight into the ranking signals, it doesn't. 100% doesn't. It has to go at least through legal right, before they're allowed to do it. So mom and COVID, did you see these during COVID? They're kind of pretty handy, right? Go to COVID search and it will like come up with maps and where cases were and all that stuff. That's all mom. So they took this, rewrote it all with using mom, created graphs, they created videos, they created images, and they put that at the top of the search results. As far as I know, unless someone knows differently, because I can't find the up, if it's updated, it has not been put in the regular search, has it? I don't think it has. They said it hasn't been regular search as of a few months ago, and I can't find an update because right now my Google is completely broken. So, um, so what do we do, right? So I just told you a bunch of heady stuff, and I was like, how do I actually apply any of this? So should you optimize for machine learning and ranking signals? If you're trying to do like rank brain or neural matching, it's ever changing. So don't try to reverse engineer it. There are ways you're going to apply best practices that will get you there, but don't try to reverse engineer it because you really can. You saw that sweet result, right? That was two years different, three years difference, right? So it changes, changes, changes. So apply it to your SEO. So you wanna make sure you give the right signals and help it not make mistakes and give you that big rank brain result. So you can look like this, like happy baby. Is everyone a happy baby? And if you do it wrong, you look like that. Scary baby. <laughs> That's a dolly image of a happy laughing baby. Okay, so simple answers. Do your normal query research, of course. Uh, check the search for rank brain issues. Write naturally. Don't optimize first. Don't give your writers like, here's my keywords, write, go, write. And then we'll go back through and optimize. This is always easy to optimize con content to the keywords if they're writing well. Pay for good writers if it's important content. Don't do AI and just rewrite a little bit. Like pay for someone to write it. This is gonna be the differentiating factor. Google doesn't want a regurgitation of everything that exists. Google wants personal experience. Google wants you to write uh, for expert, with expertise. Google wants you to show that you are somehow different. You are better. You're going out on a date. You know, you don't go out in your sweats, right? You go out and you look great. And Google wants you to make sure that your website has great, interesting, differentiating content so it's not the same as everything else. Now, if you're in the medical field or something, it's all gonna sound similar, but you can add components, right? You can add components that are like that. Um, also, you can easily get what Google's looking for in entities by just doing a search and looking at the bubbles. As you can see, the other things that Google is relating to that search really, I mean, they're right there. There are other complicated ways you can get the Google NLP um, uh, API. You can use inlinks. They have the entities. There's all ways to get entities, but for complex things. But if you're like, I just need to write something today and I don't have time for all that or we don't have the money for all that, which is often true, just go look and search and see what, when you do refinements, what are they showing you are related? because these are related entities. Schema. Martha gave an amazing talk on schema yesterday. I'm not going to get into depth like her. But schema is helping the machine learning understand better what your page is about. So I have a recipe at the time. I have the ingredients, right? Well, Google knows this is the ingredients. I don't need to figure out if it's the ingredients, I know it's the ingredients. I know this is a recipe because you gave me the schema that tells me this is a recipe. I can put it in the recipe topical vector. I know now recipe and everything on this page is related to a recipe. I know it's a news article. I know it's an article. I know Martha could probably come up with 10 better schemas than I'm talking about right now. But it's really important. It does, it's not a ranking signal. And you know, Google doesn't go, hey, schema, let's boost you. But Google goes, hey, I know what your page is about. I don't have to interpret it. I understand what you're trying to tell me. We're same as this. These are our social signals. Here's what the page is. Here is our corporate information. You know, name, address, place is a big thing with local. And they have to match exactly, right? 
So Seductor Data is on-page markup. Everyone's using it, right? I don't have to really explain it. If you're not using it, go to Martha's. Yeah, talk to Martha. Martha's schema app. She knows everything about it. Why does it matter? Because you don't want to guess. You don't want to be like, oh, I'm going to put all the content on the page, and maybe Google understands, and maybe they don't. Maybe they'll match that neural matching, and maybe it won't. Maybe it'll show up and bring. I can tell it. I can literally go, Google, this is what I look like. I have blonde hair, blue eyes, and I'm wearing a funny thing, right? So that in schema lets Google tell, tell about, we tell Google what our site's about and also the relationships on our site. And we define it. So it's an interpreter to teach Google what our site's about, what our pages are about, what we're talking about. So we look like this. Hey, Google, I'm the green droid. Not this gray matter of, I'm not sure, I have to figure it out. Anytime Google has to figure it out, it's never better for you. So we give our data meaning by using schema. We give Google a chance to give back a better answer to better match query intent. So then we go. So there's a couple more things. Well-formed text. This is from Kurzweil from a few years ago when they were trying to figure out how they would best work with natural language processing, and they called it parsemic parse face. I'm not making that up. And <laughs> well-formed text. Can Google easily understand what you're writing about? That's why you have to write for the web and not like comma, 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 and, and, and unless it's like an academic document or something like that. But also well-formed text is questions. So under, this is from that same paper. Query resembles a grammatical and well-formed question. Such a pipeline to perform accurate interpretation is better. And then they reduce error in trying to do intent matching. That doesn't mean you want to do everything as a question. But if you know there's questions you can answer, put the question in the H1 and then go, here's the answer to that question right below it, right? Because this is an opportunity for Google to very easily understand because the grammar in a question is very simple. We don't do too much complexity when it comes to asking questions, basic questions. So Google is an answer engine partially because that's how machine learning works best. Machine learning best understands that kind of grammatical construction. It's also cheaper for them and they have less error. So that's why FAQs and things did so well, right? Remember, like they just took them away and now they may be bringing them back, but like how-tos and FAQs, like how many people use those because they went right up to the top, right? That's because Google can easily understand it. It wasn't heavily weighting those. It's just like, oh, we understand what you're trying to say and ask, and here's your answer. Great, you have a great answer. Let's put you in a featured snippet. So you're gonna wanna think whenever you're doing this in intent, query terms, and context, and questions. So basically, this is what you need to do to meet all the stuff we just talked about. So you want to write in natural language. You want to just write, like, pay writers. Don't, don't think I can, oh, I don't need my budget anymore. I don't need writers because I can just use ChatGPT. You're not going to be the one in five years from now who's going to have the websites up here. That's going to be the people that are paying writers to add context, add creativity. The Verge article about SEO, right? Everyone read that? No? Oh, you must read it. It's the worst piece of art. It's the worst article ever written about SEO, but it was written very creatively, very entertainingly. And so that's a really good example of how to write, but not what to write about. The alligator party. Yeah, if you've been seeing the alligators in like social, you have to read the article because there's an alligator party. And there's somebody that no one ever heard of, uh, Kate Lee. And they're like, it's really bad. It's writing about affiliate marketing from 20 years ago and blaming the change in Google on us. But we're not even, they're not even talking about SEOs. So, but you want to focus on depth and breadth with related terms. You also want to make sure you have hierarchy. I can't tell you how many sites I see now are like, everything's off the root. Well, if everything's off the root, you've given Google no context for your site. You want to start with like a, a, a broad, like a hub page. And let's say we're not talking about coffees. And then I say, here's the different coffee things we're going to talk about. And maybe how to brew coffee, coffees of the world. And then I have an X page. And then like three levels down, I have specific pages. Google originally was formed off of academic libraries, right? So the idea Google had was they went into the, apparently the rumor, rumor, rumor is, but I did confirm with Philly yesterday, the rest is true. They go to the library, they're going to like research how to organize the world's information online. And they went, wait, we're in a library. They already did it, right? Card catalogs, anyone remember? Thank you. At least a few people do. So the title and description in a card catalog are the SERPs, title and description. The URL is the domain Dewey, the Dewey Decimal number that takes you to the book. What is the website? Your book. The book has a nice cover, your homepage. Then it tells you what's inside the book, right? And then you have a table of contents. It's 
subbed into categories, right? That's because when you go to read the book, if they just went, here is everything we know on the root, and you have no idea the context, there's no subheadings, there's no categories. That's what people are doing when they put everything on the root of the domain, right? So you wanna make sure you're writing holistically, depth and breadth, so you're not just writing generally about topics, because that's what AI does, and that's what affiliate marketers do when they spend content, and something they wanna try to eliminate. So you wanna make sure you get breadth to that, depth, right? Like you have expertise with expertise, right? If I'm gonna write about coffee, I'm gonna write about like, I know coffee, I've tasted coffee, I've done coffee, I eat it for breakfast, <laughs> right? Not just like, oh, coffee, this is like a ground that you put water over and Google doesn't want that. Um, use well-formed text, make sure you use simple web types. That's also really good for your users because users scan, they don't read. Although a little trick, if you want them to read, make the text smaller. They will read smaller text, but not too small because then Google doesn't like that either. So neither does accessibility and you can get lost here, but that's a different thing. So these are the basic things to do to meet all those algorithms we just talked about, okay? And then you look like that, and not like that. And that's it. So hopefully that was, hopefully that was helpful. Anyone have questions? What's that? Oh, welcome. No questions? Oh, I either did a really bad job or I really confused everybody. <laughs> Oh, our podcast is Webcology. It's been around for 17.